June 16th. Our reading in the Old Testament today will be from the book of 1 Kings, chapter 15, verse 25, and we'll go through chapter 17, verse 24. Here is an overview of what we'll find as we read today. In chapter 15, we'll read about a flickering lamp. God blessed Judah for David's sake, just as he blessed us for the sake of his beloved son, and because of the faithfulness of those who have gone before us. And we'll also read about a certain judgment. You see, God had promised that the house of Jeroboam would be destroyed, and Baasha was the instrument of that judgment. And then as we move on into chapter 16, we'll see that whenever uh, the kings or priests led the people into sin, God sent faithful prophets to warn them and to call them back to the true worship of Jehovah. Jehu was just such a prophet. He was not afraid to give God's message of judgment to evil King Baasha. Are we today willing to take our stand against evil? Zimri's reign was extremely brief. Rather than fall into the hands of Omri and his faction, Zimri committed suicide. Omri, too, chose to disobey God and did worse than all who were before him. And one of the worst things he did was to leave his son Ahab to reign over Israel. And now let's begin reading in the Old Testament. June 16th, 1 Kings chapter 15, verse 25, through chapter 17, verse 24. Nadab, son of Jeroboam, began to rule over Israel in the second year of King Azza's reign in Judah. He reigned in Israel two years. But he did what was evil in the Lord's sight, and followed the example of his father, continuing the sins of idolatry that Jeroboam had led Israel to commit. Then Baasha, son of Ahijah from the tribe of Issachar, plotted against Nadab and assassinated him while he and the Israelite army were laying siege to the Philistine town of Gibeathon. Baasha killed Nadab in the third year of King Azza's reign in Judah, and he became the next king of Israel. He immediately killed all the descendants of King Jeroboam, so that not one of the royal family was left, just as the Lord had promised concerning Jeroboam by the prophet Ahijah from Shiloh. This was done because Jeroboam had aroused the anger of the Lord, the God of Israel, by the sins he had committed and the sins he had led Israel to commit. The rest of the events in Nadab's reign and all his deeds are recorded in the book of the history of the kings of Israel. There was constant war between Azza and King Baasha of Israel. Baasha began to rule over Israel in the third year of King Azza's reign in Judah. Baasha reigned in Tirzah twenty-four years, but he did what was evil in the Lord's sight, and followed the example of Jeroboam, continuing the sins of idolatry that Jeroboam had led Israel to commit. This message from the Lord was delivered to King Baasha by the prophet Jehu, son of Hanani. I lifted you out of the dust to make you ruler of my people Israel, but you have followed the evil example of Jeroboam. You have aroused my anger by causing my people to sin. So now I will destroy you and your family, just as I destroyed the descendants of Jeroboam, son of Nebat. Those of your family who die in the city will be eaten by dogs, and those who die in the field will be eaten by the vultures. The rest of the events in Baasha's reign and the extent of his power are recorded in the book of the history of the kings of Israel. When Baasha died, he was buried in Tirzah. Then his son Elah became the next king. This message from the Lord had been spoken against Baasha and his family through the prophet Jehu, son of Hanani. It was delivered because Baasha had done what was evil in the Lord's sight, arousing him to anger by his sins, just like the family of Jeroboam, and also because Baasha had destroyed the family of Jeroboam. Elah, son of Baasha, began to rule over Israel from Tirzah in the twenty-sixth year of King Azza's reign in Judah. He reigned in Israel two years. Then Zimri, who commanded half of the royal chariots, made plans to kill him. One day in Tirzah, Elah was getting drunk at the home of Arza, 
the supervisor of the palace. Zimri walked in and struck him down and killed him. This happened in the twenty-seventh year of King Azza's reign in Judah. Then Zimri became the next king. Zimri immediately killed the entire royal family of Baasha, and he did not leave a single male child. He even destroyed distant relatives and friends. So Zimri destroyed the dynasty of Baasha as the Lord had promised through the prophet Jehu. This happened because of the sins of Baasha and his son Elah, and because of all the sins they led Israel to commit, arousing the anger of the Lord, the God of Israel, with their idols. The rest of the events in Elah's reign and all his deeds are recorded in the book of the history of the kings of Israel. Zimri began to rule over Israel from Tirzah in the twenty-seventh year of King Azza's reign in Judah, but he reigned only seven days. When the army of Israel, which was then engaged in attacking the Philistine town of Gibeathon, heard that Zimri had assassinated the king, they chose Omri, commander of the army, as their new king. So Omri led the army of Israel away from Gibeathon to attack Tirzah, Israel's capital. When Zimri saw that the city had been taken, he went into the citadel of the king's house and burned it down over himself and died in the flames. For he too had done what was evil in the Lord's sight, and followed the example of Jeroboam, continuing the sins of idolatry that Jeroboam had led Israel to commit. The rest of the events of Zimri's reign and his conspiracy are recorded in the book of the history of the kings of Israel. But now the people of Israel were divided into two groups. Half the people tried to make Tibni, son of Genath, their king, while the other half supported Omri. But Omri's supporters defeated the supporters of Tibni, son of Genath, so Tibni was killed, and Omri became the next king. Omri began to rule over Israel in the thirty-first year of King Azza's reign in Judah. He reigned twelve years in all, six of them in Tirzah. Then Omri bought the hill, now known as Samaria, from its owner, Shemur, for one hundred fifty pounds of silver. He built a city on it, and called the city Samaria, in honor of Shemur. But Omri did what was evil in the Lord's sight, even more than any of the kings before him. He followed the example of Jeroboam, continuing the sins of idolatry that Jeroboam had led Israel to commit. Thus he aroused the anger of the Lord, the God of Israel. The rest of the events in Omri's reign, the extent of his power, and all his deeds are recorded in the book of the history of the kings of Israel. When Omri died, he was buried in Samaria. Then his son Ahab became the next king. Ahab, son of Omri, began to rule over Israel in the thirty-eighth year of King Azza's reign in Judah. He reigned in Samaria twenty-two years. But Ahab did what was evil in the Lord's sight, even more than any of the kings before him. And as though it were not enough to live like Jeroboam, he married Jezebel, the daughter of King Ephbaal of the Sidonians, and he began to worship Baal. First he built a temple and an altar for Baal in Samaria. Then he set up an Asherah pole. He did more to arouse the anger of the Lord, the God of Israel, than any of the other kings of Israel before him. It was during his reign that Hiel, a man from Bethel, rebuilt Jericho. When he laid the foundations, his oldest son, Abiram, died. And when he finally completed it by setting up the gates, his youngest son, Segub, died. This all happened according to the message from the Lord concerning Jericho, spoken by Joshua, son of Nun. Now Elijah, who was from Tishbe in Gilead, told King Ahab, As surely as the Lord, the God of Israel, lives, the God whom I worship and serve, there will be no dew or rain during the next few years, unless I give the word. Then the Lord said to Elijah, Go to the east and hide by Kirith Brook, at a place east of where it enters the Jordan River. Drink from the brook, and eat what the ravens bring you, for I have commanded them to bring you food. So Elijah did as the Lord had told him, and camped beside Kirith Brook. 
The ravens brought him bread and meat each morning and evening, and he drank from the brook. But after a while the brook dried up, for there was no rainfall anywhere in the land. Then the Lord said to Elijah, Go and live in the village of Zarephath, near the city of Sidon. There is a widow there who will feed you. I have given her my instructions. So he went to Zarephath. As he arrived at the gates of the village, he saw a widow gathering sticks, and he asked her, Would you please bring me a cup of water? As she was going to get it, he called to her, Bring me a bite of bread, too. But she said, I swear by the Lord your God that I don't have a single piece of bread in the house, and I have only a handful of flour left in the jar and a little cooking oil in the bottom of the jug. I was just gathering a few sticks to cook this last meal, and then my son and I will die. But Elijah said to her, Don't be afraid. Go ahead and cook that last meal, but bake me a little loaf of bread first. Afterward, there will still be enough food for you and your son. For this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. There will always be plenty of flour and oil left in your containers until the time when the Lord sends rain and the crops grow again. So she did as Elijah said. And she and Elijah and her son continued to eat from her supply of flour and oil for many days. For no matter how much they used, there was always enough left in the containers, just as the Lord had promised through Elijah. Sometime later the woman's son became sick. He grew worse and worse, and finally he died. She then said to Elijah, O oh, man of God, what have you done to me? Have you come here to punish my sins by killing my son? But Elijah replied, Give me your son. And he took the boy's body from her, carried him to the upper room where he lived, and laid the body on his bed. Then Elijah cried out to the Lord, O oh, Lord my God, why have you brought tragedy on this widow who has opened her home to me, causing her son to die? And he stretched himself out over the child three times, and cried out to the Lord, O oh, Lord my God, please let this child's life return to him. The Lord heard Elijah's prayer, and the life of the child returned, and he came back to life. Then Elijah brought him down from the upper room and gave him to his mother. Look, your son is alive, he said. Then the woman told Elijah, Now I know for sure that you are a man of God and that the Lord truly speaks through you. June 16th. And now it's time to look into the New Testament. Today's reading will come from the book of Acts chapter 10. Verses 24 through 48. Acts chapter 10, 24 through 48. And here we'll see that Peter uses the keys for the third and last time as he opens the door of faith to the Gentiles. How wonderful is the providence of God! Paul, the apostle to the Gentiles, was being prepared for his life's work, and Peter was about to break down the ancient barriers between Jews and Gentiles. Known to God from eternity are all his works. But God had to prepare both Peter and Cornelius. He spoke to Cornelius while he was praying and to Peter while he was relaxing. Be alert. <laughs> you never know when or where or even how God will speak. Be alert to the voice of God. You never know when he may have a word for you. Not so, Lord, Peter said, for I have never... Well, that was his response, and of course, that kind of response leads to defeat. God was about to do a new thing, and Peter wanted to hold on to the old. Aren't we so often like Peter? We don't want God to do new things. But it's true, you cannot pour new wine into old wineskins. Lord, we pray that you would turn us into new wineskins so that you can do a new thing in us. Well... He calls him Lord, Peter does, but refuses to obey him. Yet God tenderly instructed Peter, and the apostle surrendered to his will. Peter didn't even get to finish the sermon. When he said, Whosoever believes in him will receive remission of sins, they believed and were saved. I mean, what a great way to stop a sermon. And with that, 
Let's stop our commentary here and begin reading in the New Testament. June 16th, Acts chapter 10, verses 24 through 48. They, Peter and the other believers, arrived in Caesarea the following day. Cornelius was waiting for him and had called together his relatives and close friends to meet Peter. As Peter entered his home, Cornelius fell to the floor before him in worship. But Peter pulled him up and said, Stand up, I'm a human being like you. So Cornelius got up, and they talked together and went inside where the others were assembled. Peter told them, You know it is against the Jewish laws for me to come into a Gentile home like this, but God has shown me that I should never think of anyone as impure. So I came as soon as I was sent for. Now tell me why you sent for me. Cornelius replied, Four days ago, I was praying in my house at three o'clock in the afternoon. Suddenly, a man in dazzling clothes was standing in front of me. He told me, Cornelius, your prayers have been heard, and your gifts to the poor have been noticed by God. Now send some men to Joppa and summon Simon Peter. He is staying in the home of Simon, a leather worker who lives near the shore. So I sent for you at once, and it was good of you to come. Now, here we are, waiting before God to hear the message the Lord has given you. Then Peter replied, I see very clearly that God doesn't show partiality. In every nation he accepts those who fear him and do what is right. I'm sure you've heard about the good news for the people of Israel, that there is peace with God through Jesus Christ, who is Lord of all. You know what happened all through Judea, beginning in Galilee after John the Baptist began preaching. And no doubt, you know that God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. Then Jesus went around doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. And we apostles are witnesses of all he did throughout Israel and in Jerusalem. They put him to death by crucifying him, but God raised him to life three days later. Then God allowed him to appear, not to the general public, but to us whom God had chosen beforehand to be his witnesses. We were those who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. And he ordered us to preach everywhere and to testify that Jesus is ordained of God to be the judge of all, the living and the dead. He is the one all the prophets testified about, saying that everyone who believes in him will have their sins forgiven through His name. Even as Peter was saying these things, the Holy Spirit fell upon all who had heard the message. The Jewish believers who came with Peter were amazed that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out upon the Gentiles too. And there could be no doubt about it, for they heard them speaking in tongues and praising God. Then Peter asked, Can anyone object to their being baptized? now that they have received the Holy Spirit just as we did. So he gave orders for them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Afterward, Cornelius asked him to stay with them for several days. And today we're reading in Psalm 134, verses 1 through 3. Have you ever given thanks uh, for the people who work at uh, the night shift? You know, were it not for them... You'd have no electricity or water at night, no fire or police protection, or no emergency service at the hospital. While you're asleep, others are serving, so be grateful. But do the people on the night shift give thanks? Perhaps not. The psalmist admonished the priests in the temple to give thanks as they served God and the people at night. It may have been a lonely ministry, but it was an important ministry. Your high priest in heaven intercedes for you day and night. He never grows weary or impatient. Have you told him that you're thankful for his faithful ministry? Are you willing to be like him and serve others, even on the night shift? Psalm 134, verses 1 through 3. A song for the ascent to Jerusalem. Oh, bless the Lord, all you servants of the Lord. You who serve as night watchmen in the house of the Lord, lift your hands in holiness and bless the Lord. May the Lord, who made heaven and earth, bless you from Jerusalem. Proverbs 17, 
verses 9 through 11. Disregarding another person's faults preserves love. Telling about them separates close friends. A single rebuke does more for a person of understanding than a hundred lashes on the back of a fool. Evil people seek rebellion, but they will be severely punished.